Welcome. I can talk a little bit here. And um, we're going to get started soon. So let's get started. My name is Carlos Santana. I don't play the guitar. Actually, that's I show you how to break out. Um, so today we're going to talk to you about our experiences working with end users that are migrating from, from Carpenter. Um, uh, migrating from no groups or traditional way of auto scaling to use the new CNCF project uh, Carpenter and um, how we've been seeing custom, uh, end users migrating um, using Argo workflows. So we even color coordinated. I'll take the part of Argo workflows since I've been working with Argo workflows for last year and a half, Argo CD, uh, more than that. And then um, Raj will talk about uh, introducing himself and talk about Carpenter, the side. He's wearing the blue shirt. <laughs> oh, Carlos is tall. Um, Thank you for coming to this talk. My name is uh, Raj Dipsa. I'm a principal solutions architect for containers and serverless, uh, working at AWS, engaged with the Carpenter from early days, and helped uh, multiple customers migrate. All right. So who here is using cluster autoscaler to scale their Kubernetes clusters? A lot of folks. All right. So cluster autoscaler is great, of course. Like, it is a CNCF project, part of the SIG autoscaling. Uh, however, for those of you who are in the platform team, you know with Cluster Autoscaler, you need to create node groups. Uh, so this situation, when I talk to the uh, end users, is quite common that as a platform team, you create a node group which can run certain types of uh, virtual machines because you have to specify what kind of worker nodes you can run in this uh, node group. Now, if an application team tries to deploy a different kinds of workload, with all the Gen AI hype, perhaps a GPU workload, uh, but there is no compute node group for a GPU worker nodes, so this pod will not be able to be scheduled. So what you, the platform team, needs to do is you need to log in, create another node group for GPU instances, and this node group can provision uh, GPU uh, worker nodes, and then that pod will get scheduled. So this is one of the challenge that our end users face. So now, Car think Carpenter is the latest new generation cluster autoscaler. This is also a CNCF project. AWS started it, we donated it to CNCF, and now it's part of the SIG autoscaling. With Carpenter, think of this as cluster autoscaler with steroids without the side, side effects. Um, with Carpenter, you do not need to maintain any node groups. So let's say the same scenario, we have a C5.2x large or a virtual machine running, and a team comes and deploys a GPU workload. You don't need to go and create a new node group. Carpenter, based on the workload, will automatically provision a GPU instance, and then the cube scheduler will schedule the pod into that node. So Carpenter provisions appropriate instances based on your pod specification file. It is also faster than cluster autoscaler. Um, so I'm certain a lot of you are new to the Carpenter because it's relatively newer project. So this is how the flow in relation to cluster autoscaler. So you have a horizontal pod autoscaler scaling the pods, and at certain point, all your existing worker nodes runs out of capacity then the pod goes to pending and schedulable. And with cluster autoscaler, that triggers cluster autoscaler. Cluster autoscaler talks to autoscaling group, and autoscaling group provisions EC2, or worker nodes. With Carpenter, this part is skipped. You do not need to create and maintain any autoscaling group. Carpenter directly talks with virtual machine fleet and provisions worker nodes. And you can control what kind of virtual machines and what kind of AMI you want using two YAML files. We call them node pool and node class. Also note that all the concepts that I'm talking about, they are not any uh, cloud-specific concepts. You can extend this and use in any cloud provider. So let's take a look at a sample node pool YAML file. On the right, we have the YAML file. So you could see the kind is node pool, and you have 
lot of flexibility on specifying what kind of instance type you need. So for example, you could say instance category CMRT, instance size, not in nano, micro, small, medium, and instance hypervisor nitro. You also have the option to skip all of it and Carpenter will automatically determine the best instance type from all the instance types that's available to it. You can also limit how many instances this node pool can provision. You could see the limits on the bottom. So as soon as the collected number of virtual CPU reaches 100, this node pool will stop provisioning instances. And one of the advantage of Carpenter is it always prioritizes cost. So it will always dynamically determine what is the best instance type based on your workload as well as the cost. And going one step further, not only you can specify the instance types, you can also have availability zone flexibility. Um, so you could specify, for example, hey, spin up my instances in US West 2A or US West 2B, and you can also keep this totally blank, and this will determine the availability zone with the highest capacity. Now the important part is Carpenter works with Kubernetes scheduling. Um, so it works with the node selector, node affinity, tens and tolerations, and topology spread. So if we take a look at an example, we see the node pool here on the left and a workload a specification file on the right. Uh, so on the node pool, you will see that I'm specifying annotations, label, and tens and tolerations, and tens. So you can use all of this because any virtual machine that this node pool provisions, it will have these annotations, labels, and tens attached. So on the right, you can see I am scheduling a deployment where I'm using node selector using the label team colon team A that this node pool is using. So you can use this label to schedule pods for different applications. And like I said before, all the YAMLs that I'm showing here they are not any cloud uh, provider specific. So it works nicely with the Argo CD, right? All it sees is YAML. It can bring in the YAML and then it applies to the cluster. So we hear this a lot, like Carpenter is great. You are like, okay, this is a lot of uh, talk about Carpenter, but what about the real world scenario? So Carlos and I work with a lot of uh, large customers and they already have cluster autoscaler running they have multi-tenant, multiple applications. So rarely, there's a switch. One day, they hit the red button and everything goes to Carpenter, right? You'd like to roll it out gradually. Uh, so apps will gradually move from cluster autoscaler to Carpenter. Both cluster autoscaler and Carpenter can coexist for separate applications. And that's what we created this talk for, because we wanted to show you how you can migrate with these real world considerations in mind. And this process also works for complete move in one go. So this is how the process goes. If you're trying to migrate from cluster autoscaler to Carpenter, you already have node groups, so you can extract the label, tens, capacity type, and architecture, and put it in the Carpenter node pool, and our script actually helps you do all that. And then you can extract security groups, subnets, IAM roles, and tags, and put it in Carpenter uh, node class. Remember those two YAML files that Carpenter uses. So let's take a look at the flow. Let's say your cluster is running cluster autoscaler. You have the node group, which is running cluster autoscaler and core DNS. And then you have the application node group, which is tied to autoscaling group, which is running m5.large instances with the application pods running inside it. And even though I'm showing autoscaling group, if you are not using autoscaling group, this will work with node groups without autoscaling group as well. So now you define node pool and node class, and then you install Carpenter. So you could see on the top, on the node group, we have the Carpenter pods running now. And then you define the node pool node class with the information you have from your node group. And then you set the desired and minimum size to zero. This is all in one go. So as soon as you do that, this existing node group, all the pods will evict. 
Don't get scared. This respects what disruption budget. Uh, so if you have something set, it is not going to ev evict everything in one go. It will respect that. So at that point, since the node group maximum size and minimum size, all, minimum size is set to zero, desired is set to zero, so Carpenter will see there is a lot of pending unschedulable pods, and Carpenter will provision a worker node, and all the pods will get scheduled. So for those of you who noticed, I was a little bit cheeky there. Instead of Carpenter provisioning two M5 dot extra large, Carpenter provisioned one M5 dot two X large, because Carpenter is always considering what's the best way to accommodate these pods in a most cost-optimized way. So Carpenter will always do that adjustment. All right, and after everything is migrated, you can delete the node group and the auto-scaling group. Now, what if you want to do gradual node group migration? That's fine as well. Instead of setting everything to zero, you set desired mean max to a reduced number. And in that case, some pods will get evicted. Again, they will all respect pod disruption budget. They will go pending. Carpenter will provision a new worker node, and Cube Scheduler will schedule those. And then when everything is migrated, you can delete the autoscaling group and the node group. All right, so now I went through the workflow. Now Carlos is gonna show how it actually looks with the actual demo. Carlos, good luck with the demo gods. Yeah, the demo gods. <laughs> Seen all the folks uh, successfully work with the Wi-Fi. So let's switch to um, uh, one of the scenarios that we use uh, for this talk. And, and the idea is for, uh, as a platform team, let's see if Argo workflow is, is up and running. So as a platform team, maybe you're working with Argo workflow, so you're familiar with the Argo workflow UI, you create templates. But when you are, we are in the situations with end, end users, they have uh, organizations and teams that are using this cluster. So, it's not in their power to just one day say, next week, we're going to migrate every cluster. Uh, let's say they have a hundred, we have folks that have a thousand of clusters. Um, move them right away to Carpenter. As a platform team or DevOps team, uh, you want to create templates, uh, workflow templates that they can have a self-serving portal, right? Um, developers or that team or that organization can come to Argo workflows and pick or create a workflow out of using your templates to migrate their, their node groups. And sometimes there's multiple teams in one cluster. So one team is ready to move. Another team, maybe they want to hold off. So you, you as a platform team, need to provide a self-serving uh, assets and automation. At the end of the day, this is automation. But you want to make it self-serve that anyone, when they're ready, they can migrate with no downtime. And, and that's the most important thing that some folks don't want to migrate because they're afraid of like, if they have downtime based uh, migrating uh, to a different auto scaling. So in this case, I have uh, two workflows. It's one to migrate to Carpenter, but I also in the GitHub repo, you can see that I have a different one that is rollback. And it, there's always a question, that's always a question that comes up, right? When say like, you can use this to migrate the next question that the end user asks, like, what if something goes wrong? How do I roll back? So we wrote an example of how you can go directly from Carpenter back to the state that it was before you migrated without downtime. Um, so here's an example of that workflow. Um, I didn't use Hera. Uh, Hera is another way of creating our workflows. Uh, but I used just YAML, and I didn't use a uh, DAG. So let's, let's kick it off. Um, so I will submit it, select the entry point, which is migrate. Um, maybe this is, could be in Argo workflows or maybe using an IDP, an internal developer platform, uh, something like Backstage or, or something else that people come in and give you the inputs for the form that you want to launch. In this case, I'll select one of the uh, clusters um, if you're doing one cluster at a time. And then autos, uh, auto, auto, um, Cluster auto scaler, uh, if you want to just like reduce it to zero because you don't want to have waste, or you want to keep it running because there might be other teams in the cluster using it. Um, so in this case, I'll I'll take it down um, and then submit it, and then I'll show a little bit of the of the YAML. Uh, so in this case, um, 
I'm using a combination of uh, I'm using Python SDKs to talk to the AWS to the cloud provider to get the number of node groups, extract that information that uh, Raj was explaining. So in this case, this function here uh, workflow uh, was getting the output. So the output is a a list of the node groups that I found in the cluster. So in this case, I have 10 teams, each one with their uh, node group. And then I did a fan out in here, so you can see. Uh, let me see how I close this. So this is the, the fan out. Um, demo gods are working on my side. Um, so they're migrating. So I'm extracting all the metadata of these node groups, and I want to create equivalent uh, Carpenter node pools and um, Carpenter objects. And this is a migration of one to one. Like a lot of end users don't want to like risk it, right? Because these are production uh, clusters that are like handling our taxes and public sector finance. So they just want to move to the new technology and then optimize to get advantages of consolidating of the resources and pick the right instance. But in this case, it's an example. It's a safe way of, of migrating. Uh, so this this function here, uh, let's see if we can find the, the logs should be here. Um, and then these tasks are running in Carpenter. So like the Argo workflows are running in Carpenter. And so in this case, I was able to create a no class. So I extracted information like uh, the work, workload identity, AIM role, uh, the security groups associated to that no group. So that's for networking firewalls. Uh, the subnets that are available for that specific no group, and the tags uh, that are available. In, in that, and then I created an equivalent uh, node pool. In this case, it says, it says EC2 node, but it's a, using a different cloud provider will be their own cloud provider, but it's a, it's a node class. And the second object that um, Raj was mentioning is the node pool. In this case, um, I use the node pool to save the information of the node group. So if I migrate back, I can migrate picking the resource, the, the annotations, information and recreate that node group that if I want to roll back. The other one is um, the, the metadata information about it and the specs. So things like uh, that um, I was using AMD and uh, using natural and then the C5 large, like Alawash uh, was explaining, in this case was a C5 large and then the taints. So the taints is in this case was a scenario maybe that in this case, Team 6 uh, wanted to have a, a node group with certain characteristics, and maybe they have a chargeback of like, we're paying for, that no, for those nodes. So they have a taint, meaning that only these workloads land in, in there, and all that information is abstracted. In this case, I'm, I'm doing a apply directly into the same cluster, uh, but I could apply it to a, a remote cluster, or if you're combining this doesn't require Argo CD. That's one of the things that we did. Some, custom, some end users are not using Argo CD. They just want to migrate. Um, but if you're using Argo CD, you can put this YAML file in, in Git and then have Argo CD reconcile uh, those YAML files. Um, in this case, is uh, putting down the autoscaler. And then the last one is, let's see if we can see the logs in here. Um, basically taking down the, the, the node group. So if we look at um, the animation, uh, we had an animation here that on the left, on the left side was the, the node groups, and then on the right side are the carpenters. So eventually everything in this cluster uh, will move, so they're, uh, they're still moving. So I had a, like around, I don't know, 100 uh, nodes uh, using node groups because I, um, Disable auto auto scaler, um, and then they're moving they're moving into Carpenter. So you can see in the right side um, here that if you use the consolidation, uh, you Carpenter only deploys the the minimum amount of nodes to satisfy those pods that are impending. So you can see here that I got uh, 29, 29 nodes uh, running here, and all the information is in the GitHub repo if you want to recreate it and also the assets uh, to do that. But the, the key aspect is uh, Argo workflows we have seen that is becoming kind of like the automation tool for platform engineering of, of have been used for a lot for AI and ML. 
but Kubernetes being 10 years old this year in 2024, is going to the maturity that actually the APIs are being my, uh, deprecated or removed. So we have seen Argo workflows also being used for uh, clusters upgrades, uh, upgrading APIs, upgrading the whole cluster API, if you're using a managed Kubernetes cluster like uh, in a cloud provider or your own. So Argo workflows is actually a tool that's becoming not just deploying net new apps, but also migrating in place clusters uh, for end users that want to do it in a safe way. And also, since it's, it's Kubernetes and kind of the platform engineering trend right now is build all your platforms on top of Kubernetes APIs. So it plays well with other tools that are building, using Kubernetes to build platforms in addition of running containers. So that's the demo. It looks like it worked. We can go back to the slides. Let's see where we were. And this is the, the QR code for the GitHub repo. It's under the GitHub Bridge um, uh, GitHub organization. There are other examples there. Uh, the, whole repo, uh, the whole example was deployed through Argo CD, so you can just do a, um, in this case, I'm, I think we're using Terraform. So Terraform Apply will create kind of a small cluster, uh, the control plane, uh, Argo workflows, Carpenter, all the controllers are running in a ephemeral nodes called Far Fargate. And then everything else is running in node groups, and then you can run the, the workflow to migrate. Um, so uh, give us feedback. Uh, check out the GitHub. Um, Want to say last word? Or we'll be here a week? Yes, uh, we'll be on the AWS booth. So come by. Uh, we have more Carpenter demos. If you have more questions on Carpenter, happy to answer any question there as well. Yeah. Okay.